Hi and welcome back here on my study channel, the London Writing Academic. So I'm here today with a back to basics video, which is basically back to basics is a playlist here on my channel and also a series on my blog, the London Writing Academy, which you can access at blog.nafisalondon.co.uk. And it's all about going back to basics in terms of academic writing skills. Now, the reason why I called it this is because um, the topics that I am going to cover um, in this mini series and playlist are um, basic academic skills that, um, you know, you need to master um, in terms of, you know, developing your skills in both undergraduate and postgraduate study. However, um, they are also skills that, you know, a lot of people need to refresh and that is absolutely fine. Um, when I first started this PhD program that I'm doing, um, there was a forum that we were discussing a specific paper that we had to write. And there were people there who hadn't studied for 20 years plus. Um, of course, they have their first degrees, they have their masters, but um, they were just kind of, you know, a little bit shaky and apprehensive about um, basic academic skills such as, you know, referencing, um, even which voice to use, whether to use the passive voice, whether to lead with I, the I voice, um, paraphrasing, all of these basic skills. Um, so it's not that they didn't know what they were, but of course, you know, because, you know, they spent years working in industry where perhaps academic writing wasn't um, necessary for them to do, um, you know, it, they kind of needed to brush up on those skills. So um, for those, uh, that profile of people, and also for people who are getting started or getting into academic writing, who don't have experience of that, these are basic skills. And, you know, while they are um, a starting point um, for the basis of good academic writing, they're also skills that, you know, we need to revisit, we need to sharpen um, and that's fine because life skills, um, you don't just learn them and that's it for life. A lot of the time you need to come back and kind of refresh and, you know, what am I doing? Um, for me, referencing is one. Referencing is something that, especially if you have to switch between different styles of referencing, it is easy to kind of forget the conventions and you have to check it. So that's the idea behind the playlist and the series that I'm doing both on this channel and on my blog back to basics so it's to cover all the you know the basics of academic writing so if you um, need this and you find this useful please do subscribe to this channel if you haven't already take a look at my blog I put a lot of free content that is useful um, and of course you know have a look at my academic writing community on my patreon um, which is basically my online school um, where you'll have access to a plethora of academic and study skills resources um, and don't forget to hit the like button um, that will help me out and it also help me to know to make um, videos like this in the future so today the basic academic and writing skill that we are going to be focusing on is understanding the essay question and I am going to be looking, or we, we are going to be looking at five instructional verbs, which are common. They come up in undergraduate and postgraduate um, assignments. Um, and essentially, the, there is one, or there are several concepts, but the main concept I want to get across today is I want my students to step away I want you to step away from just simply describing and I speak as somebody who I teach both undergraduate and postgraduate students academic writing and for the students who want to get the top marks they say to me you know how do I get the top marks what they have to do what is essential is to step away from simply just describing what they are writing about and it's something that, you know, a lot of educational systems that my students um, are used to or where, you know, they, they, they come from require them to memorize information and to simply just regurgitate. Um, but if you've watched any of my other 
videos, you will know that critical thinking is a big thing. Um, in order to, you know, if you are after the top marks, you must demonstrate level a high level of criticality critical thinking and um, which goes beyond it's not enough to just describe something um something if you've read a whole textbook i do not need to see that in your writing i do not need to be told things that i already know the examiner doesn't need to be told things that he or she already knows so it's really about stepping away from that so with the five instructional verbs that we'll be looking at today i'll be showing you what is required and what it doesn't mean, because a lot of people will look at these words and they will think, you know, OK, without really understanding what is being asked, they will just give a description of, you know, what they've read or just say what they've read. And that is really um, at best, it will just get you a basic pass. Uh, like I said, it doesn't show it doesn't demonstrate any form of criticality. It doesn't show any form of, you know, um, analytical skills. It doesn't show any synthesis, ability to synthesize from sources. By synthesis of sources, I mean reading a wide range of literature and being able to, you know, streamline it in an essay and, you know, put your argument forward clearly um, and logically. Okay. So it is important that um, obviously you understand what you are being asked to do and that you do that effectively. So we're going to be focusing on five instructional verbs today, which are analyze, assess, consider, discuss and evaluate. Now, of course, this is not an exhaustive list. There are more instructional verbs and I will put a list of the most common um, and uh, what is required. I'll put that in a document and I'll have that available on my academic community. Again, the link is in the description bar um, below this video. Um, but today we're just going to be focusing on the five because these are the most common, um, both undergraduate and postgraduate um, study. And it's something that you will be asked to write about. So really understanding what it requires and being clear on what it isn't is, you know, a really, really good starting point. So let's begin. So the first verb I'm going to look at, the first instructional verb is analyze. Okay, so when you are asked to analyze, you are being asked to look in depth at how and why something is the way it is, using supporting arguments as evidence. Okay, now again, um, I'd like to draw your attention to supporting arguments as evidence. This is a recurring theme. You will see this is a requirement of all the instructional verbs which we are looking at today. So firstly, I would like to draw your attention to this right here. Um, this is a bottle of Chanel nail polish, which happens to be the color that I'm writing. And yes, if any of you are familiar with my other channel, do not worry. This is not a beauty video and it certainly isn't a makeup tutorial. However, what I would like to demonstrate is the concept of analyze. If we were to analyze this bottle, it would be, it would require looking in detail at how and why it is the way it is. So if I was to tell you this is a bottle of Chanel nail polish and it, the color is what looks like pink and the lid is black, you can clearly see what I'm telling you. I haven't told you anything groundbreaking. There is no revelation here. Um, and you're not gonna be wowed. You're not gonna be particularly, there's nothing that you don't already know that I've told you because I'm describing. And that is what you want to get away from when you are asked to analyze. So if we're being asked to analyze this bottle, again, we're looking in depth at how and why something is the way it is. So firstly, of course, we'd have to start with some form of description. So I could say, you know, um, it's a bottle of, you know, what looks like pink. We look closer at the color. Um, and I think the color here, it says camellia. So we've gone a little bit step closer. Then we'll say, the material, this is glass. And perhaps, you know, the reason why it is glass is because um, the manufacturer wanted the customer or the potential customer to see the color, um, the contents within the 
the bottle need to be displayed. So um, by taking, you know, um, a transparent material such as glass to um, house the product allows for the customer to see what is, what is inside. Okay, so why did the why did the manufacturer use glass rather than plastic? Plastic is an option. Um, it could be for several reasons. It could be that, you know, glass gives it more of a luxurious feel. Obviously, Chanel is a high end product um, and given, you know, using glass as opposed to glass plastic gives it more of a luxury feel. Um, also, it could be that, you know, glass is more environmentally friendly and the manufacturer is um, environmentally conscious. It could be the case. Uh, if we look at the lid, um, if we take it off, we can see that there's a double lid. There's a one lid and there is a second lid. So why is that the case? Why did the manufacturer use a double lid? Why wouldn't it be OK to just use one lid? OK, um, it could be that um, having two lids, one serves as an aesthetic function. Um, it looks good. It fits a certain it keeps the certain shape that the manufacturer wanted, which is a kind of um, cuboid um, oblong sh shape. Um, it could be for erg ergonomic purposes. You know, it fits nicely into the hand. It's nice to hold. And then it could also be for functionality. Um, so if we take this off, you can see that this lid requires a twist feature and then we can open the bottle and, you know, we have access to the contents inside. Um, so this has a twist feature um, but it could also serve as a protective measure. So if you close this, maybe it is not as secure as it would be if it has a double lid feature. So the double lid allows for aesthetic, um, in terms of ergonomics, it feels better to hold um, rather than just having it without. Um, and then also it serves, you know, to protect the contents from spillage. So if there was a spillage initially, um, the second lid would serve as a protective feature that would stop the liquid or the products from leaking. Now, can you see how we've taken a closer look at how the bottle is the way it is and why it is the way it is. It serves the function, the purpose. However, we still have to go a step further. So if in terms of talking about the glass, um, the glass feature as opposed to plastic, I would need to bring in evidence that glass is, I've said that glass could be more environmentally friendly, but I have to show that this is the case. Um, it's not enough for me to say this. So I would need to show from evidence of reading, whether it's from a textbook, from a journal article, that glass is more environmentally friendly or more biodegradable, whatever word you want to use, than plastic. And that is perhaps why um, the manufacturer decided to use this. I would also need to show support from other um, literature that um, the, de the design uh, the concept of the design, maybe having a double lid feature is something that um, nail polish manufacturers like to use. So if we go back to what analyzing involves, you can see we have, we have looked in depth at how and why the Chanel nail polish bottle is the way it is. And then if we bring in the evidence about the glass being more environmentally friendly or more biodegradable. And we bring in evidence from maybe design books about why um, certain manufacturers use certain designs. Then we have fulfilled the criteria of supporting arguments as evidence. And we've stepped away from simply describing and telling the reader or the viewer what they can already see. So what analyzing isn't is simply describing something a trend or a pattern because that does not show criticality that does not show analytical skills it is a basic basic concept of describing something is at the bottom of the pyramid that i have previously spoken about bloom's taxonomy i will leave the link in the description bar um, i suggest you have a look at that description is not a high 
highly regarded analytical skill and it is simply not enough to describe something. Okay, moving on, the second instructional verb, assess. So it's often you will be asked to assess something. You'll be given a, often a sentence um, and at the end it will say assess or the assess, the instructional verb assess may come at the beginning of the sentence. So what does assess mean? Assess requires you to judge the quality, importance or effectiveness of something supported by reasons for your judgment. Again, you can see this is a re repeating pattern, supported by reasons. So you need to bring in evidence from your reading. You need to show that you have engaged with the literature. So let's take a closer look. If you judge the quality and importance of something, you really, again, it goes beyond describing. So again, by engaging with the literature, you will see, you know, what, what is quality? You will see, you know, you'll be able to judge, but you will support and say, you know, according to what you have read, this is what is regarded as high quality or this is regarded as important. Therefore, you'll be able to judge the quality, importance or effectiveness of something. But the key idea here is you have to bring in evidence from reading because otherwise it's very easy for students. You know, anyone can make um, uh, an assessment based on their own personal opinion. But in academic writing, everything you say must be supported with evidence from sources. So it is key that you support your reasons for judgment by engaging, by showing that you've engaged with the literature. So you do need to show what you have read and how that informs you to make a judgment of the quality, importance or effectiveness of something, such as this product that we looked at in the first, um, the first example of Analyze. What assess is not is simply stating advantages and disadvantages of something. Again, if you state advantage if you just simply state the advantages and disadvantages of something, it's just describing. It's describing, it really doesn't show any form of critical thinking. Um, and assess does not mean simply stating advantages and disadvantages of something. Again, you need to go a step beyond that and engage with the literature, find the support from reading textbooks, journal articles, um, and engage and show that you can judge the quality of something based on what you have read using that evidence to support the arguments you make in favor of some things, quality, importance or effectiveness. Moving on to the third instructional verb, consider. So uh, consider is another common instructional verb that does appear a lot in undergraduate and postgraduate essays. And obviously the word consider means to think. Um, it's a synonym to think, but in terms of an instructional verb, consider requires you to think carefully, usually to a certain extent about something before drawing a conclusion. You will need to look at various aspects and or different perspectives to your own. So again, the fact that you need to look at various aspects and different perspectives, again, it requires you to engage with the literature. Simply, it means you need to read. You need to read and be informed. What is the debate in your field? Or what is what does the literature say? What evidence can you gather from the books, from the journal articles, from the sources that you have read? So obviously here, the key thing is to think carefully, okay? Think carefully, consider. Now, if you're thinking carefully, this goes beyond you simply stating your opinion. If you're going to think carefully, you will have to look at various aspects which are different from your own. And that is where your reading comes in. You've read a wide variety of sources and you've gained different perspectives. And once you've done that, and you've looked at that in relation to a specific topic, then you will need to draw a conclusion, okay? Now, it is very common for you to be told, consider the extent that, consider the extent of, or um, 
to what extent does blah, blah, blah. Okay. So when you're asked to consider to a certain extent, obviously within the scope of what you have read, how far is what is being said true? That is something for you to think carefully about. And again, um, you need to think if you if you are being asked to think carefully, the issue at hand is multifaceted by multifaceted. I mean, multidimensional <laughs> by multidimensional. I mean, there are more sides um, to to your own. OK, there are different perspectives and you need to demonstrate that you have thought carefully about these before you present your own conclusion. OK, so again, the key is support evidence by engaging with the literature. So what consider does not mean is simply saying what you think without support or evidence from sources. This is not only just going back to, you know, the basic skill of describing, but also not presenting support or evidence from sources means you just haven't engaged with the literature. So therefore you have not thought carefully. And in order to consider, you need to demonstrate that you have, you have the ability to think carefully. Okay, moving on to the fourth instructional verb, discuss, okay? So again, discuss is another common one where you'll be given a statement or a sentence and at the end of that, usually will be accompanied by discuss, okay? Now, again, please understand that this does not mean describe. It doesn't mean describe. Discuss requires you to look specifically at issues surrounding a specific topic and make arguments for and or against based on evidence from sources. Again, the recurring pattern, evidence from sources you need to read, you must demonstrate in your writing that you have engaged with the literature and you can only do that if you have read a variety of sources. So again, like I said, look at specific issues surrounding a specific topic. When you discuss, obviously you don't typically discuss something by yourself. A discussion is usually a dialogue of two or more people. Now in writing, this is exactly the same case. In writing, if you are being asked to discuss, you will need to look at specific issues, but again, it usually is more than one point. It will require a minimum of two, but most of the time it is, again, multifaceted, multidimensional, or simply there are different perspectives. It is, if you are being asked to discuss something, usually it's something that is debate worthy. It is usually something that is controversial. It is something that there are different opinions. And then of course there is your own opinion. So you can see here, you need to make arguments for and or against based on evidence from sources. So you've done your reading, you've taken out all the interesting points that you want to present, but you have to do this by showing that, yes, you can make an argument for something and against something, and you can back this up because yes, you can demonstrate that you have read the the debate, you, you are aware of the debates in the field, the current debates in the field. And the way that you are aware of this is because you are able to present evidence from what you have read. A very important thing is when we say arguments for and against, if it's a discussion, you must also show a balance. You cannot be one-sided and simply just present everything. If it's a discussion, like I said, it involves a dialogue, usually of two or more. And with a dialogue, it has to show a balance. Now, can you form, can you present your opinion? This is where students have to be very clear. Yes and no. You can present your opinion through the arguments you form, supported by evidence from reading. Okay, but you also have to show what is the what are the counter arguments. It's fine that you make arguments, but you have to show that yes, you are aware of other perspectives and different opinions from the literature that you've read. 
therefore it has to be there has to be a balance there if you make arguments for you have to present that there are also arguments against so therefore discuss discuss does not mean simply stating whether you are for or against something without giving evidence or reasons again this is a very very basic level and it's describing and to be honest with you the only academic writing that you can get away with this is only in IELTS exam writing um, and that is the only reason why you can even get away with that is because the nature of the exam is focusing on your language um, it's not really focusing on how well you know and understand the topic um, so therefore you don't really need to bring in um, evidence of engaging with the literature however at undergraduate and postgraduate level mm -hmm. writing this is absolutely not the case um, you must show that you have engaged with the literature and you have to show that you have critical thinking abilities and you are able to discuss by engaging in looking at both sides of an argument and bringing in supporting evidence to show that you have engaged with the literature okay last but not least the fifth instructional verb evaluate so again evaluate is one i guess it's slightly similar to assess but it also isn't because evaluate does in involve um the prior instructional verb of discussing as well it does um involve a little bit more than just simply you know um going straight and making a value judgment so if you're being asked to evaluate you need to decide on the worth of something by drawing your own value judgments again supported with evidence from sources that is this is fundamental again you can see all the instructional verbs require this evidence from sources and how do you do that you show that you engage you show that you have engaged with the literature by reading in and around the subject so Deciding on the net worth of something, it, again, you would have to look widely, you'd have to look at, you know, the usefulness and the uselessness, the advantages and the dis disadvantages, the effectiveness or the ineffectiveness, um, you, you, it, it goes, you have to look widely before you draw your own value judgments. OK, so again, if we look at the products that we started off with here, if you were going to evaluate this again, you would look at things like, OK, how useful is this? How you know, how does it serve its function? Um, again, we can look at the design and we can say, OK, yes, you know, the fact that it has a double lid design, it could be useful in terms of um, preventing leakage. Um, it could also be a deterrent, perhaps for young children, because they would have to if they could just access the product by just doing that it's quite easy and it could be dangerous but if they have to twist it it could be harder it could be more challenging um again we would look at you know uh using glass is that actually the best material or you know if i drop it could it shatter um could it be dangerous maybe in this case plastic would be better again you'd have to bring in evidence. You'd have to you know, show that you've read that this particular glass is uh, either shatterproof, it's either shatterproof or it's um, shatter resistant or it shatters easily. It's all about evidence. It's not simply about saying something. It's simply, it goes beyond simply saying something. You have to say something and support what you are saying with evidence that shows, again, you have engaged with the literature, you know what's being said in the field and you understand this and you reflect this in your work. Um, and that is how you form your own value judgments because you've been able to read, understand, engage, and now critically apply that in order to evaluate deciding on the net worth of something. What evaluate is not, is simply describing the strengths and weaknesses of something. And that is something that is something that I see so much of the time where students think, OK, you know, evaluate. I'll just simply describe the strengths and weaknesses of something. I'll just say the strengths and weaknesses of this. But you haven't formed your own value judgment because in order to do that, you need to show how do the strengths and weaknesses decide, help you to decide the value judgment? How do you draw the value? Do you think this... OK, so the price of this, let's say, is 25 pounds. Um, 
if you simply just describe the strengths and weaknesses, you haven't shown whether you think this is worth £25. But if you engage and you, you know, you support the evidence, like I said, you know, that they've used shatterproof glass, they've thought about, you know, um, the product in terms of, you know, uh, leakage or and being leak proof. And, you know, you're able to form um, the judgment that this is worth the retail price of £25, then you have evaluated the product rather than just simply stating the strengths of weaknesses, which most people know what the strengths of weaknesses of something are. You haven't really given, you, you, you haven't presented anything that is worthy of them um, reading your work. People read your work because they want to know what, what do you have? What's your take on things? What do you have to, to add? What can they gain from it? So simply describing strengths and weaknesses doesn't cut it for evaluating something. Um, you need to make sure that you look beyond that. You look at the strengths and the weaknesses and you bring in evidence from the literature and then you form your own value judgment. Is this nail polish worth the retail price of 25 pounds? Okay, so. That is all I have for today. Um, as I mentioned, I do hope that you know um, you found this useful. Um, these five instructional verbs are possibly the most common, but they are not the only instructional verbs you will be asked to write essays on. So like I said, um, if you head over to my community, you will see a whole list um, with the definitions of more instructional verbs that you know explain um, what you need to do when you have been given these essay questions and like I said um, the main thing I'd like you to take away from this video is one to move away from describing simply describing is a very very basic critical thinking skill um, it's not going to get you the top marks and the second thing is that whatever instructional verb you've been asked to write your essay on you must show that you have engaged with the literature by bringing in evidence as support from the sources that you have read. Okay, so um, that's it for today. Um, again, um, this, the table that has the definitions and of what the instructional verbs are and what they are not will be available on my blog. I will leave a link to the blog post, but my blog, the London Writing Academy, is available at blog.nafisalondon.co.uk so don't forget to like this video and of course if you haven't subscribed do hit the subscribe button and you'll see me soon for the continuation of this uh, series back to basics for academic and study skills here bye bye <laughs>